Before we label a patient as having SLE, we need to rule out other disorders. In other words, lupus is only one of many autoimmune conditions that is associated with inflammatory arthritis and constitutional symptoms of fatigue and aching. A third of lupus patients have positive blood tests for rheumatoid arthritis. Some lupus patients have overlapping features with scleroderma, and sometimes the presence of Raynaud's could be either lupus or scleroderma. Myositis to a mild degree is seen in lupus to a greater degree in polymyositis or dermatomyositis. Anchor-positive vasculitis is often mistaken for SLE. Also mistaken for lupus are the spondyloarthropathies because one can get inflammation in the hands and the feet and in the sacroiliac area. Inflammatory bowel disease sometimes, sometimes smolders for years before it's ultimately diagnosed. And some patients who have low titer anti-nuclear antibodies could be told that they have lupus when they turn out to have inflammatory bowel disease. The Shets is manifested by large numbers of oral ulcerations that has unique features like enodosum. HLA-B51 is more common in this group. One third of all lupus patients in the United States are African American and sarcoidosis is extremely common in this group and sometimes the presentations can overlap that ANAs in this population are uncommon. Sjogren's syndrome, which is dry eyes and dry mouth with arthritis, is usually seen in an older age group than we usually see in SLE, but a third of all lupus patients ultimately have dry eye and dry mouth and there's a lot of overlapping. 10 to 15% with SLE have Hashimoto's thyroiditis or even Graves' disease. And it seems that 20% of individuals with one autoimmune disease have a second one. In older patients, we like to rule out polymyalgia rheumatica, which gives a very high sedimentation rate along with stiffness and aching. And there is a large group of patients, probably more than even has SLE, of individuals who have an ANA, may be tired and achy and have some swollen joints, but don't meet established criteria for SLE. We call those UCTD. Over a 10-year follow-up period, the patients with undifferentiated connective tissue disease, and about a third the condition goes away, and about a third it stays the same, and in maybe, maybe a little more, and in about 20%, these individuals go on to develop rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, or scleroderma. I might want to mention here that there is a new classification or criteria being developed for SLE in collaboration with the American College of Rheumatology and the European League Against Rheumatism that is attempting to address some of these difficulties and uncertainties, and we expect these to be published in the next year or two. Infections often mimic lupus. Lupus patients and rheumatoid patients have um, infection. Patients with infections often have ANAs and rheumatoid factors. Viral conditions uh, such as Epstein-Barr, cytomegalovirus are often mistaken. And since the false positive syphilis serology it reflects a spirochete, which is Lyme is also being a spirochete, that sometimes Patients with Lyme and lupus and vice versa have false positive tests for the other. Fibromyalgia is not a disease, it's a syndrome. It's a pain amplification syndrome of the um, afferent sensory system where it leads to muscle discomfort. About 20 to 30 percent with lupus have fibromyalgia. This can be caused by medications such as corticosteroids used to treat lupus. It also can be uh, caused by the stresses of coping with the disorder. And it's important that with fibromyalgia patients, we don't treat them with anti-inflammatories because it is not an inflammatory process. Sometimes acute allergic reactions are mistaken for lupus. Sometimes early myasthenia gravis or multiple sclerosis is mistaken, as well as an early Hodgkin's or lymphoma. Uh, is, is, and other malignancies can be mistaken for SLE. 
There are 15,000 cases in the United States of drug-induced lupus where certain agents, especially antiarrhythmics, anti-TNFs given for rheumatoid arthritis, uh, statins, anticonvulsants, can, can be mistaken for SLE. Drug-induced lupus is not SLE because it goes away when the offending drug is removed. The exception to this would be minocycline. And finally, some patients have low titer ANAs and low titer white counts and low levels of uh, white counts, and they don't have lupus. And sometimes in young women who are malnourished or substance abuse or bipolar, this is often a confounding factor. So no single test can determine whether a patient has lupus, but several laboratory tests help make the diagnosis. In everybody, we get an ANA, or anti-nuclear antibody. We often do a reflex panel, which includes other serologies, DNA, SM, RNP, SSA, SSB. The latter two standing for Sjogren's syndrome, RNP, mixed connective tissue disease, SM, usually confirmatory for lupus, as is anti-double-stranded DNA. Anti-cardiolipin antibody is seen in one-third of lupus patients, either that or an anti-phospholipid antibody, and one-third of them, or one-third of one-third, or one-ninth, or 11% of lupus patients have a thromboembolic complication as a result of the disease. One can have antiphospholipid syndrome without having lupus. Skin biopsies confirm lupus, and I've already discussed the pathologic features. Renal biopsies as well. So we screen our patients. We try to first use readily available and inexpensive testing. Then we do the reflex testing, which we showed above, and then for niche conditions or confusing conditions or to stage specific organ manifestations, we do more specialized testing. So the easy test to do that costs are very easy to get no matter what health plan you have and are usually affordable for the uninsured include a CBC, CMT urine, muscle enzymes, acute phase reactants such as a C-reactive protein or sedimentation rate, and screening for organ involvement if there are complaints, such as doing an EKG or chest X-ray, as well as getting ANA, C3 and C4 complements, and anti-double-stranded DNA. If we are suspicious of rheumatoid arthritis, we would get a rheumatoid factor, anti-CCP, and image the joints to see if there are classic rheumatoid features, such as erosive disease. We like to see if there is a prolonged clotting time that may be associated with antiphospholipid syndrome, and 2D echoes are very good screens for pericarditis or pulmonary hypertension, which is often early and can be diagnosed in a lupus patient. And finally, for $200 or less, one can do a bone densitometry because there is a high prevalence of osteoporosis in patients who have the disease over years, and if we can have a baseline, we can look for change in bone mineralization and be proactive. Regarding reflux ANA panels, we anti, I've already mentioned uh, what these antibodies do. They are relatively inexpensive and usually part of a reflux panel. Sometimes we need CT or MR imaging to figure out what's going on in somebody with uh, central nervous system complaints. We might want to get a better look at somebody with seizure-like conditions or um, muscle inflammation. Sometimes a bone scan is used to look for inflammation when acute phase reactants are negative. And then there is a variety of niche serologies that we can do under certain circumstances when warranted. 